Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Betty Tay, and welcome to our first ever uh, live chat and webinar on uh, from Beating Hearts. And we are also proud to say that we are doing a series of arrhythmias uh, from the basic of arrhythmias and how to identify ECGs and how to actually read ECGs because we all want you to feel comfortable, okay, very and safe when you practice um, as a house officer or a medical officer or eventually when you become a consultant. These are all very important basic um, skills that you need. And then we will go on to discuss the treatment next week and then we will do case scenarios and also quizzes and we will also give you ECGs to report. Um, and this moment, I share the screen with uh, Dr. Ahmad Niza. Dr. Ahmad Niza is actually a consultant electrophysiologist. So we do have a real expert on ECGs and arrhythmias with us. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give Ahmad Niza the spotlight and then we will start with the first slide. Hi guys. Yeah. I think this so, will be uh, an interesting session. Yes, uh, we will be very interactive after the slides. Um, so the pattern physiology of arrhythmias, if you imagine the heart to be a pump and for it to function well, we must make sure that two things is um, well. means the cardiac electrical system, which control all events that occur when our heart pumps, must be in tip-top condition. Okay. Of course, the coronary arteries that supplies the heart for it to function well must also be in tip-top condition. Now, if you look at the cardiac electrical system, uh, the basis of it is like a wiring system. The SA node is the first switch okay, that is located within the wall of the right atrium. And the SA node generally generates the electrical impulse that is carried to the AV node by a special conducting tissue. And then upon reaching the AV node, the electrical impulse is then relayed down the bundle of his. And the electrical impulse generated by the SA node causes the right and left atrium to contract and then depolarization of the ventricle happens shortly after. Now, of course, Nisa, maybe you could explain this further. Um, I will use the pointer. So this is actually the SA node. Okay. What you see is, of course, a very well illustrated kind of wiring system, which is um, highlighted in green here. But uh, Nisa, can you explain more about this electrical system uh, of the heart? Well, you, you can imagine that the SA node is an impulse uh, generator. So, um, the, the condition that, that can affect the SA node will therefore uh, give rise to a problem of impulse formation. Uh, on the other hand, the impulse must travel uh, in the upper chamber as well as through the AV node to reach the ventricles before uh, it can depolarize the ventricles. So there is uh, an element of conduction that is necessary uh, with regards to the electrical system. So pathology can arise from the impulse formation as well as impulse conduction. So you can have a problem with impulse conduction through the AV node and therefore it will cause an obstruction of the impulses from the SA node to travel down the ventricle and you, you can get a bradycardia in that situation. But you can also have abnormal circuits uh, occurring in the heart and that gives rise to pathology. Okay, we, I think we will go on first, yes. So before we go on to the pathology of uh, an abnormal ECG, we must, of course, know how does a normal ECG look like and what are the normal okay, uh, standard of an ECG. Maybe Niza would like to speak on this. Um, you have the P, well, uh, I think everybody knows that uh, the ECG is named uh, by letters and PQRST uh, and U are uh, those letters. P uh, is actually denotes uh, atrial activation. 
but there is also an atrial conduction element. Um, if you look at the width of the P wave, it gives rise to uh, how quickly the atrium can be depolarized. The PR interval, um, which is the, the onset between, from the onset of the P wave to the, uh, to the Q wave, uh, is actually the time required to conduct uh, through the atrium and the AV node uh, before it reaches the His bundle. And then the QRS is actually uh, the depolarization of the ventricle as the ventricle gets uh, the, 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 the current actually depolarize the ventricle. And finally, you have the, the T wave, well, which uh, actually denotes uh, the repolarization process of the ventricles. There is a uh, repolarization of the atrium, but it's usually buried within the QRS complex. Okay. Oh, sorry. Now, this is the normal ECG. When you look at a normal ECG, it is very important not just to see the morphology of the ECGs because it is important because uh, a lot of MIs, a lot of uh, non-ST elevation, and a lot of pathology can be read actually from the morphology of the pattern of the ECGs. But you must look at the rate and the rhythm. The normal rate, as we know, is 60 to 100. Okay. Anything above that is called tachyarrhythmia. Anything below that is bradyarrhythmia. So we can then divide. Okay. Uh, of course, this is uh, just now we discussed this, so I won't go further into this. Is there anything you'd like to add, Nisa, for this? Um, no, not really. Not really. No, we go to the next slide. Arrhythmias. So, um, okay, I forgot to actually change the slide for you just now, arrhythmias. Okay, so there's, there are four groups of arrhythmias. Okay, arrhythmia can happen in, like an extra bit. Arrhythmia can also happen in supraventricular tachycardia, or it can be ventricular tachycardia. And then, of course, you have the bradyarrhythmias. arrhythmias. Okay, um, now in extra bit, we have premature atrial or ventricle or junctional contraction. Basically, any part of the heart okay, can transmit electrical impulse. Right or wrong, uh, Nisa? Yeah, it's true. Yeah, so with that, any part of the heart muscle that conduct an extra bit, okay, then it becomes a premature bit. Uh, supraventricular tachycardia is different. Okay, These are actually tachycardias that originate from above the AV node. Uh, maybe you would like to elaborate more on it? Um, the hallmark of a supraventricular tachycardia is the fact that the QRS is actually narrow and it looks normal. Um, compared to ventricular tachycardia, where the QRS complex can be broad and bizarre, um, the, the thing, the difference between most supraventricular tachycardia is whether they are regular or irregular. Um, atrial fibrillation is an irregular rhythm, while the other types of supraventricular tachycardia tends to be very regular. Okay. We will show you um, and go through with you every single ECG. Um, okay. But before that, of course, arrhythmias can be a pathological problem means a disease by itself and it's like all diseases it will present with certain symptoms and the symptoms are usually palpitation chest pain profuse sweating in some patients because there may be a drop in blood pressure uh, loss of consciousness is very common in patients with bradic arrhythmia or ventricular arrhythmias giddiness shortness of breath reduce effort tolerance or leg swelling when they present with heart failure. Anything you'd like to add here, Nisa? Well, if, if, you, can, if you consider the symptoms, uh, if it's just plain palpitation and uh, there are no associated symptoms um, and the blood pressure is stable, then you can consider the patient stable. It is important to identify patients who are unstable and unstable. Unstable patients generally would have chest pain. They are uh, sweating profusely. They may be dizzy or near syncope, or they may be unconscious. Um, and 
they may be they may have signs of heart failure like uh, breathlessness or talk near uh, even leg swelling in those situation the the condition becomes dire and uh, you have to uh, be wary that uh, they the arrhythmias can uh, become worse or they can develop cardiac arrest yeah. so we must um, always keep in mind that the arrhythmias could be the primary problem but it could also be a secondary problem to other problems uh, other diseases such as a heart attack uh, or let's say thyrotoxicosis it can always so when you examine patients or take history it is very important to look for other diseases okay um, so it that is very important so we now talk about okay this is a slide that Nisa wanted me to change but I forgot so it's not atrial arrhythmia it's supraventricular arrhythmias so supraventricular arrhythmias actually encompasses um, atrial tachycardia, atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, SVT, AV re-entry tachycardia. Okay, we will go through the slides one by one. Okay, Niza would like to comment on this one. When it comes to atrial tachycardia, um, you will have to be able to say that uh, this P wave that precedes the QRS complex is not the same as the one in sinus tachycardia. Um, okay, the best the case, place to the P wave is here. That's right. Okay, well, dotted line, uh, dotted, uh, my red dot is. Okay. Right. And why is this an abnormal P wave? As you can see, it is not upright, right? It's usually upright in lead two. That's right. And the PR interval here is rather short as well. The PR, ah, yes. And then the heart rate is faster than usual. I think it's about 100, slightly more than 100 here. Yeah. Yes, so this is actually atrial tachycardia. The pacer is actually not sinus node in nature. Um, your SA node in nature is actually coming from your atrium. Exactly where in the atrium, of course, we cannot tell. Um, sometimes you can have atrial tachycardia in patients who are anxious, okay? Um, and then you can have atrial tachycardia in patients who have um, valve disorders. Uh, they are quite easily treated, I would say, right? But we will talk about treatment the next time. Now, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is a must know. Okay, atrial fibrillation is the commonest arrhythmia mostly seen anywhere when you practice. And usually, you may, you may have underlying heart condition. It is also common in the elderly. Okay? One of the presentation of uh, atrial fibrillation, one common cause in young adults is thyrotoxicosis, either because of cardiomyopathy due to thyrotoxicosis or the disease itself for with just the T4 being high. Okay? Now, atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke because of clots form in the atrial appendage. Maybe you'd like to elaborate more on this atrial fibrillation, um, Nisa? Yeah. Um, if you compare atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation, the biggest difference is actually the irregularity of the RR intervals and the absence of P waves. Right? So, so um, you immediately you you'll be able to uh, differentiate between atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. Um, you can see that in this ECG, the RR intervals are variable uh, and they are irregular. And uh, if you look at the baseline, you don't see any P waves. Uh, in, you may see fibrillation waves, but uh, you're not actually seeing discrete P waves. Um, so when the QRS is narrow, the RR interval is irregular and you don't see uh, P preceding each QRS complex, then uh, that is atrial fibrillation. Um, so and if you uh, look at the right, if you can yeah. spot the extra abnormality, um, I would say it will make you a very, very good cardiologist. There's actually Q in 2, 3 and APF, right? Yeah. Q wave 
yeah, two, three, and AVL. So this atrial fibrillation, one, okay, is irregular. Two is usually rapid. Okay, so now this is an atrial fibrillation with the rate that is poorly controlled. Okay, it is very important because um, when you actually see atrial fibrillation, and it may have been for a long, long time, means the patient might have atrial fibrillation for a long time. So they are in actually chronic atrial fibrillation. Patient can go out in and out of atrial fibrillation and that can be paroxysmal. And the treatment is quite different for these patients, okay? Whether they are in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent or chronic. Now, sorry. What's the difference between atrial fibrillation? Okay, we have, so again, Atrial fibrillation will actually reduce cardiac output, especially uh, in patients who have already poor LV function. Uh, atrial fibrillation, especially fast one, uh, and the rate is not well controlled, you can actually um, cause further damage to the heart function. Okay, this is atrial flutter. Maybe you'd like to comment on this atrial flutter. Okay. The, the difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter is in the baseline, in atrial flutter, you see this uh, a sawtooth appearance, right? Um, you should be able to see it uh, easily in the 2, 3 AVF and V1. So look carefully in, that, uh, in, in those leads. It can be quite difficult to identify atrial flutter sometimes when it becomes, uh, there are two to one conduction. Yes, that's right. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, can, you can help you is actually um, if you have a tachycardia which is narrow complex and it has a rate of about 150 or around that, um, then you must suspect atrial flutter and look carefully to see, particularly in 2, 3 AVF and lead 1, whether you can identify atrial flutter. Um, the, one of the things that you can do further is actually uh, do a carotid massage. And when you actually do carotid massage, you might be able to expose, uh, because you're, you're reducing the conduction of, from the atrium to the ventricle, uh, you're slowing the conduction in the AV node, and you might be able to identify the atrial flutter uh, waves uh, when you actually do that. And uh, that can help the diagnosis, actually. Um, is the risk of patients with atrial flutter going to atrial fibrillation higher? Um, well, in, in general, um, about uh, in long term wise, about 30% of people who present with only atrial flutter will develop atrial fibrillation later. And it's uh, a risk. If they, if they have already both at the same time, then the risk of atrial fibrillation is very high. Okay. Um, and uh, is the risk of a uh, stroke the same in atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter? It, it is. It's still the same. It's the same, huh? Yes. Okay. So now, okay, this is a narrow complex tachycardia and it's very fast. I probably think this is about uh, close to 200. Okay. And what, um, what kind of... Difference there are there are differences between certain kind of SVT, right? They all narrow complex, but uh, can you tell us the differences that we may see in certain uh, SVT? We might not be able to tell from the ECG, but uh, as an electrophysiologist, can you just tell us more about this conduction system that uh, generates this SVT? Broadly, there are two types of SVTs, uh, or rather circus movement tachycardias. Um, you can either have uh, a short circuit or a circus movement that uh, only involves a small circuit around the AV node, which is known as AV nodal reentry tachycardia. Or you may have a circuit involving an extra pathway that connects uh, the atrium and the ventricle, either on the right or the left AV ring. So um, that's called an AV re-entry tachycardia. But for, for all uh, purposes, they present with narrow complex tachycardia that is regular. 
And if you concentrate carefully to identify P waves, because if you are able to identify P waves preceding the QRS complex, then that makes that atrial tachycardia, which is about 5% of people with supraventricular tachycardia. The other two pathologies are generally 95% of them are due to the other two pathologies I've mentioned. Now, they both are treated the same, so it may not be necessary for you to actually be able to tell the difference. But the way to do it is actually to identify where you find the P waves after the QRS complex. In this sort of ECG, you do not actually, you're not able to identify P waves after the QRS complex. Um, you can imagine P waves, but uh, I don't actually see a P wave. Okay. The one yeah. that it, it, it's difficult to say whether that's a P wave or not, you know. Okay. Because we um, don't we don't know. Yes. But anyway, so it's very if difficult. You to tell. Yeah. If you identify P waves that is uh, after the QRS complex, yet the R P interval is short, that's usually accessory pathway. If you don't identify P waves because it's buried in the QRS complex, that generally would be AV nodal reentry tachycardia or AV nodal. But at your level, as course officer or medical officer, identifying it as SVT is fine actually. Yes, identifying as SVT is fine. So it's a narrow complex tachycardia. Two is some people tolerate it very well. Just remember, okay? So they don't feel it or they just have palpitation. But some patients do not tolerate SVT well at all. The blood pressure will drop. They actually um, will be sweating away, okay? And they feel very, very uncomfortable. Now you still need to treat some, most times, okay, by just IV adenosine, which we will discuss next week. But please remember that some patients actually do not tolerate SVT well. And it's important for you to diagnose SVT because treatment is extremely easy in emergency setup. Okay. Now, after you have terminated the SVT, it is also important to do a baseline ECG in sinus rhythm. And this is the reason why. Okay, Niza, maybe you'd like to share this? Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is well known. Uh, it's named after three gentlemen, Mr. Wolf, Dr. Wolf, Dr. Parkinson, Dr. White. What they identified is actually, um, it, they, they identified a connection uh, between the ECG finding that you see here um, and uh, the pathology, which is an extra bundle that connects the atrium and the ventricle other than the AV node. Okay. Now, because in WPW syndrome, there is conduction in both the AV node as well as the accessory pathway. You will have an area of the ventricle that is pre-excited. And that pre-excitation gives you that slurred upstroke of the QRS complex and the shortened PR interval. So you see in front of, the, uh, in front of that delta wave there is a P wave. And you don't see a PR interval because the, the delta actually encroach upon the P wave itself. Um, yes, it's a very short PR interval. Correct. And the other abnormality that you see in people with WPW syndrome is an abnormality in the repolarization. So you see a bit of an ST depression. That is typical in people with WPW. That does not actually say that there is ischemia. That is just a feature of WPW syndrome. Now, okay. WPW syndrome is important to, to know because there are a number of them, 1 in 30,000 are exposed to sudden death. So uh, identifying patients with WPW is important. And how do they die suddenly? Usually because of atrial fibrillation? Or yes. Uh, the important, the reason why they are exposed to sudden death is because this accessory pathway has got this property where it can conduct all or nothing. If, uh, if it can conduct rapidly, uh, if you have atrial fibrillation, you may develop a rate in the upper chamber close to 600 beats per minute. And when this extra pathway can conduct rapidly, it can actually conduct up to say 200 beats per minute, and that may actually trigger ventricular fibrillation. And, uh, and that is the reason why they're exposed to sudden death. Okay. 
Uh, we move on to ventricular tachycardias. Of course, ventricular tachycardias are uh, a lot more sinister, sinister than uh, supraventricular tachycardias. Uh, but most are, of course, benign, like ventricular premature contraction. Even your accelerated idioventricular rhythm is quite uh, benign, right, Nisa? Um, yeah, they, they are relatively benign. Yes, but uh, of course, there are patients uh, with ventricular tachycardia and uh, ventricular fibrillation is, of course, where there will be no cardiac output whatsoever. To start the point, and... Um, the other two, can you maybe elaborate more? Because I and myself um, am not familiar. Okay. One of the things that is important is in ventricular tachycardia, you must know that this is usually a precursor of ventricular fibrillation. So they can deteriorate to ventricular fibrillation. And that's very important, uh, therefore, to treat these people with urgency. Um, they can be divided into both a regular tachycardia as well as an irregular one. The tosa de poire or polymorphic tachycardia is irregular. And, uh, and they generally are unstable because they can quickly develop into ventricular fibrillation. The, the arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia is actually a pathology. Uh, it's a form of cardiomyopathy that exposes these patients to ventricular tachycardia. And uh, most ventricular tachycardia... Is it idiopathic? Are... Sorry, let me stop you there. Is it idiopathic or no. is it genetic? It's a form of cardiomyopathy, actually. There is a, a, a change where that it occurs um, in the myocardium of uh, mainly the right ventricle where uh, muscle bundles are replaced by fatty tissues. And as a result, because this develops uh, as the, fish, the person ages, uh, you will get abnormal circuit forming in the ventricle. And they, they actually develop re-entry ventricular arrhythmias. Um, most ventricular arrhythmias are re-entry in mechanism, um, except for uh, in, maybe in people with tosa de poire. Um, these are usually uh, due to um, uh, automaticity uh, of the heart. Um, so, the major difference is actually in people with ventricular tachycardia, the majority of them have a pathology. Um, there are cases of primary electrical disease uh, that present with ventricular tachycardia, but the majority of patients with ventricular tachycardia do have underlying pathology. So, always, always a good history, a good medical examination before you actually... Um, can be can familiarize yourself with all the diseases that and you will feel comfortable as you go along don't worry about it it is a lot about experience being a doctor okay so this ventricular ectopic is very simple as you can see here these are all regular okay ecgs and then you have an ectopic it is very common uh, some people, it's just an incidental finding that you find it. They don't even have symptoms. Some patients actually have symptoms of um, the heart dropping. Or some patients actually have cough. It's, um, it's very common for them to have cough, right? Uh, do you see yeah. that in practice? Because I get it all. Yeah, I get it myself. One of, the, uh, one of the things that uh, you probably need to draw attention to this DCG is you, you have a, a ectopic that is not uniform. You know? yes. This is a polymorphic sort of uh, ectopic. Um, so this and, is different. Uh, that's different. And uh, that's also uh, something that uh, you should be forewarned because um, this can actually, because you can develop an R on T phenomenon like this because they're so uh, irregular in that sense yes. that uh, they can trigger uh, arrhythmias or sustain arrhythmias. Yes, and this sustain arrhythmias will look like this. This is broad complex, obviously, you can see it. Um, how do you tell uh, a ventricular tachycardia from a supraventricular tachycardia that is, let's say, uh, with a brander branch? The, the hallmark is actually the width of the QRS, right? If you have, let's say, um, a 
a narrow complex tachycardia. That pertains to the QRS complex. Here, you could obviously see that the QRS complex is broad and is bizarre. So this is, when you have a broad complex tachycardia, I would suggest that you treat it like ventricular tachycardia. Now, there is this interest always to say that, uh, could it be that this is a right bundle branch block? You can see yes. that it looks a little bit like a right bundle branch block. Yes. But for all purposes at your level, I would think that you treat any broad complex tachycardia as a VT until proven otherwise. Yes. So uh, it'll be a lot safer that way. Always. Um, one way of doing it would be for you to be, if you have an older ECG, a previous ECG. So if you can quickly look at the old ECG, whether they have a right bundle branch block or not, then the, uh, that can help you. Um, there are other criteria uh, that uh, you can look at. Uh, one immediate criteria that you can use is actually look at the AVR. If you have a, a positive R wave, uh, an R wave in AVR, that should tell you that this is ventricular tachycardia. You don't get that in right bundle branch block. And that's a very quick way of doing it, actually. And then the morphology of the, the QRS in V1 and V6 will give you an idea, but you can read about that. But uh, yes. as long as you remember a broad complex tachycardia must be treated as VT until proven otherwise, you're safe. Yes. Okay. Now, this is something that you need to recognize and you need to know because if a patient was, let's say, conscious and alert, coming in with chest pain and suddenly lose consciousness and your ECG tracing on your monitor shows this, what is the first thing that you must do? Neither? <laughs> you have to actually defibrillate this patient. You have to put a patch on or to get a defibrillator and cardiovert or defibrillate this patient because this is ventricular fibrillation. Yes, and this is the cause of death, uh, sudden cause of death in many patients at home because uh, one, uh, we don't have many people who know how to do CPR, okay? And now if you cannot recognize this ECG, okay, you should go back to medical school. Okay, this is a very important ECG and a very important take home message on a patient, if you see in ER that was conscious and become unconscious suddenly, this is something that you need to treat immediately. Okay, and again, just now, uh, Niza was talking about polymorphic um, ventricular tachycardia. Okay, this is one of an example. Uh, Niza, maybe you'd like to elaborate? Yeah. Um, if you looked at the previous ECG, you see that the, um, the QRS complex are identical to one another. So we term that monomorphic, which means it is only in one form. But when you look at this particular ECG, it's not ventricular fibrillation. Uh, there is a regularity to this rhythm, but yet um, the morphology of each QRS complex is different. And if you can imagine that the points of this uh, QRS complex seem to twist around a point or a baseline, that's when the term dosa de point comes from, which means twisting around a point. Um, it's, it's French. Yeah. So, but the, the simple term is it is a polymorphic VT. And a polymorphic VT can quickly become ventricular fibrillation. You look at the lower panel, it develops into ventricular fibrillation. Towards the end, you see that it is already fibrillation. So very quickly, they can uh, go into ventricular fibrillation. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, is important in this group of people is um, you, must, you must know that um, there is a large number of uh, poisons that can cause it, particularly arrhythmic drugs. Uh, and they also may have a familial history of sudden death. Or, um, so if they present with this, they may have uh, some familial electrical disease, like, for example, um, long QT syndrome, um, Brugada syndrome, which we'll be discussing later. So this 
this one is again an emergency. You need to treat it. You need to know what is the underlying cause. So a 12 lead ECG after treatment is extremely important. You need to know the QT's interval. And you need to take a very thorough um, history about recent medications that they could have been taking. Make sure that their electrolytes are all well balanced, okay, all the time. And they need to be treated long term for this. Okay. Now we go to bradyarrhythmias. And bradyarrhythmias actually are, is very simple. Basically, there's a heart block. And of course, we have a sick sinus syndrome. Maybe, uh, Niza, you'd like to tell us about the sick sinus syndrome? Okay. Um, sick sinus syndrome is actually a condition where there is major problem is actually an impulse formation. Um, there are, um, so it usually affects the SA node. But uh, it doesn't actually give you an idea what the pathology is. Majority of these patients uh, have uh, what you call degenerative disease. So they're elderly people who say SA node has, is disease. Uh, the underlying cause of the disease can be varied. It can be due to choreography disease, ischemia, can be due to uh, a previous infection, uh, and it can be worsened by drugs uh, that uh, affect the impulse for generation of the SA node. Um, along with the abnormality of impulse uh, formation, there is quite often uh, a problem of uh, impulse conduction as well. So associated with the SA node disease is uh, AV node disease as well as conduction tissue disease. So it's generally a degenerative disease uh, in general. It's common in two age groups, usually 60 and 80 years old. So there are two modes uh, of presentation. And um, they, uh, they usually present with symptoms of syncope, uh, near syncope, uh, or breathlessness, or even uh, frank heart failure. But the, the problem with this some kind, this arrhythmia is sometimes the patient is well when they come to see you. It yeah, is very it can be intermittent. They can be paroxysmal. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of time we don't get the diagnosis of the arrhythmia. Um, and we have to do, um, even let's say a 24 halter may not catch anything. Okay. Yeah. So it is very, sometimes very difficult to actually. Um, make a diagnosis, a correct and accurate diagnosis of arrhythmias. Um, so, and even a patient who is 80 and he comes to you with, let's say, giddiness or loss of consciousness, and when he sees you and he's well, and you suspect sick sinus syndrome, it is also very difficult to catch sometimes. So, uh, but always bear in mind, always bear in mind. I'm so sorry, but I don't think I have an ECG of six sinus syndrome. But um, I didn't show. Um, of course, first degree heart block is just basically a prolonged PR interval. Um, usually not um, not uh, sinister in any way. But this is a second degree heart block. Maybe Niza would like to explain the ECG further. Okay. Um, the the term, the terms though that we use are a little bit uh, of a misnomer, isn't it? When yes. we have first degree AV blocks, and then you have uh, type one, type two AV blocks, <laughs> they're not actually AV blocks; they are delayed conduction. So oh, the, that's the, right. That's right. It actually there's this is not an AV block, right? Yes, it's a delayed yeah. conduction. So um, you you find that uh, there is a progressively delayed conduction through the atrium and the AV node before you have one uh, P wave that is not conducted. So yeah. in a type 1 Wenke bar or Mobis type 1, you have progressively increasing PR interval and then you have a lead that is dropped and not conducted. So there is a progressive delay in conduction. Um, so that's type 1. Type 2 Type 2, you don't okay. see the delay. So this is still type 1, basically. No, the bottom one. The bottom one, okay. 
the bottom yes. one, uh, you, you don't actually see a, a delay. Uh, you have, in fact, the, the, the bottom one is probably quite a high degree because uh, there are multiple uh, conduction blocks. Um, in type two, you generally have either slightly delayed uh, PR or prolonged PR interval, and they tend to remain the same before a bead is dropped right? and not conducted. Um, the, the two are different in a sense because in Mobis type one, the AV block is usually in the AV node. And uh, when it's in the AV node, it's generally benign. When it's Mobis type two block, the conduction defect is usually in the below the AV node, which means either in the his bundle or lower than the his bundle. So the connotation there is different. Type two, Mobis type two AV block have a higher risk of developing complete heart block and probably sudden death as well. Whereas Mobis type one is generally benign. So third degree heart block in it's third degree right. heart block, yeah, you yeah. don't see any association between the atrium and the ventricle. They are beating at both their own. They are beating at a, with a, on a different drum actually. So you see, the atrial rate is regular, maybe seventy to eighty, which is a normal P, uh, sinus rate. And you see that the ventricular, the QRS rate, can be between usually at about forty beats per minute or lower. And uh, there is no association between the P and the QRS because you see the PR interval is everywhere. There is no uh, gradual prolongation, no fixed PR interval. And, and this is complete heart block. And um, uh, six sinus syndrome more common or heart blocks more common? Six sinus is more common than complete more heart common. Yeah, I, I apologize. I, I forgot to put in a slide for six sinus syndrome. Anyway, we end here on ECG recognition for our first session. Um, I would share the six sinus syndrome um, ECG maybe the next time. Maybe all can unmute and then uh, we will take questions from now. Um, how do I unmute everybody? Or they you have to go back to Zoom. New, yeah, yeah. I will maybe I so I have to unmute everybody. Yeah. I'm asked to unmute. So, ask to unmute. How do I ask to unmute? Hi, every hold on. Huh? Can you unmute yourself? Um, okay, this yeah, uh, is. Yeah, so I think uh, those who have a question uh, can ask now. You can either yeah. type in the type in the chat box or just uh, unmute your unmute your mic to ask the question. Uh, but doctor, there's uh, someone who asked a question in uh, the chat group. Uh, okay. Brandon asked, at what rate should we define it as fast AF? Oh, no, no, fast AF. Oh, I see. Okay, uh, Niza, maybe. I would consider any rate above 130 to 140 is fast. So above 140, definitely. Um, I think I would always like to treat AF um, and uh, treat the heart rate between the 60 to 100. Uh, wouldn't you say that? Um, and I think that this... Um, very important to treat the heart rate because um, you can actually get heart failure with uh, tachyarrhythmias, not just atrial fibrillation, but many kinds of tachyarrhythmias. Basically, the heart cannot cope at that rate after a prolonged period. Yeah. Um, and then Brandon asked, what's the difference between the management of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter? Brandon, do tune in next week because next week we are a whole talk on how to treat um, tachyarrhythmias and radiarrhythmias uh, both pharmacologically and also devices and procedures. Uh, I'm not sure if we can cover everything in one session but we're going to try that as much as possible. Okay. Um, and Brandon asked what's the treatment option. Okay, so all treatment will be covered next week. Do 
sign in next week. Okay. And is there a significant differentiating AF into valvular AF and non-valvular AF? That's a very good question. Yes, when you come to treatment of patients with atrial fibrillation, uh, there is a lot of difference with uh, non-valvular AF and valvular AF, as in the drug of choice in, um, how do you say, diluting the blood. Okay, we want, because atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke. So you want to start them on newer agents, but these newer agents basically do not, are not um, in the guideline for valvular AF. They are in the guideline to uh, reduce the risk of, atri uh, of stroke in non-valvular AF. Yeah. So if you can unmute all, and then you can ask questions, um, that would be good. Any more questions? I think that's what's important there is in people with valvular AF, the risk for stroke is extremely high. Yes, that's right. And um, most, uh, in most trials, they do not include people with valvular AF because it would be unethical not to anticoagulate them. Um, so and that is why there's a difference. Uh, so people in valv with valvular AF needs to be anticoagulated because their risk for um, stroke is extremely high. Um, okay. Tan, anything? Where's Tan? How come Tan is mute? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, yeah, okay. Tan, uh, how do you I unmute everybody? I need to do it individually or they can do it themselves, right? Yeah, I think they can do it themselves. But uh, everybody seems a bit shy to ask questions. And um, other than Brandon, Brandon is asking all the best Basically. questions. Uh, I think Brendan has one more question. Uh, may I know, is it possible for an AF to cause hemorrhagic stroke? Oh, okay. Uh, not AF alone, but the treatment of AF can cause hemorrhagic stroke. Um, yes, when you anticoagulate the patient, it is very, very... It's a difficult and a very fine line sometimes, especially when we were using warfarin more often previously. Now we are changed to newer agents, and these newer agents seems to be um, less, um, I mean, it's less likely to cause hemorrhagic stroke, but still the risk is there. Because we are talking about patients who are we treating with AF, who are usually in the elderly age group. So when they are in the elderly age group, they are already um, at the risk of getting hemorrhagic stroke. Okay, they have they have risks. So it is very difficult. Now, yes, uh, Brandon said over -vulfurnization. Yes, true. Uh, sometimes it's not even over. The, the INR could be within the normal range, okay? That you intend it to be, but the fact is, they the they are coagul anticoagulated. So even though it's not over warfarinization, it is still an increased risk, basically because of their age and that they are on warfarin. Is there anything to add? Um, I think if you the, the, when we um, start using the um, what do you call them the doex right yes. um, we we realize that um, warfarin actually increases the risk for intracranial hemorrhage um, because the incidence of uh, intracranial hemorrhage with uh, the new oral anticoagulants are actually much much lower much um, lower it's about 0.6% compared to 1.2 to 1.8 percent in warfarin actually so i think it's the, the effect of warfarin because it acts on many places in the coagulation cascade whereas uh, the, the newer oral anticoagulants are very specific agents um, so they often do not uh, actually increase the risk for intracranial hemorrhage eventually um, 
practice medicine, you will find that actually to warfarinize a patient is a very tedious effort. Okay, um, and uh, a lot of patients, and then there's a lot of drug interaction with warfarin. Okay, and then patients sometimes don't come for regular INR check. Okay, some doctors find it very difficult to keep it maintain the INR between the let's say 2.5 to 3.5. So yes, there is a lot of problems with the use of warfarin. Yes. Somebody asked, Darren, uh, Wendy, let's see, Wendy asked, how do you differentiate proxismal AF with chronic and acute AF? Um, if you look at paroxysmal AF, you can differentiate them symptomatically. Um, with paroxysmal AF, they tend to go in and out of atrial fibrillation. Generally speaking, um, they do so only in several hours, less than 48 hours. Um, the 48 hour interval is important because if they persist in AF longer than that period, then you need to anticoagulate them before they can, uh, you can revert them to sinus rhythm, either chemically or electrically. Um, but within that 48 hours, they have a tendency to revert. In those people with persistent atrial fibrillation, um, the difference is these people will need intervention before they can uh, recover sinus rhythm. And in chronic AF, um, it's those people with persistent AF that, that may have actually been left in atrial fibrillation uh, for longer periods. Um, and uh, acute AF, though, is uh, um, another term that you use for people with uh, sudden onset atrial fibrillation that is rapid. So that's acute AF. And they yes. may have the associated symptoms. Yeah. Yes, for example, when you have an elderly lady or, uh, I mean, an elderly patient with sepsis, okay, or an infection or let's say post-op, it is very common to see acute AF. And during that time, it is quite easy to actually revert them back to sinus rhythm. Uh, you treat the underlying cause, then you treat the atrial fibrillation and you treat the rate. So sometimes even electrolyte imbalance can cause acute AF very commonly seen and you will see a lot of it when you do um, your housemanship because you will be called a lot especially in surgical ward in yeah in orthopedic in medicine it is a very common thing so next week you will know your drugs much much better on how to treat atrial fibrillation now darren asked may i know what is the science what are the signs to look for and what to expect when there's an unstable arrhythmia? Okay, um, usually uh, when you have unstable arrhythmias, even if you have stable arrhythmias, okay, um, even in SVT I was just mentioning, patients can actually feel very ill, they can have very low blood pressure. Um, the signs would be blood pressure. I mean, I have patients who have had a troponin T that's positive because of SVT, not VT. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, Niza, you would like to add to that? Well, what are the signs to look for? Associated symptoms like chest pains, dizziness, near syncope, breathlessness, signs of heart failure, hypotension, um, or maybe, you know, diaphoresis. These are signs that the patient is unstable. Um, so, some of these uh, signs or symptoms may be due to underlying disease. Say if you have a 60-year-old man who presents, despite the fact that he's presenting with SVT, he may have underlying coronary artery disease. So he becomes unstable as a result. So it, he may have chest pain, he may have hypotension. Um, and that makes him unstable. So you have to take the whole picture. Um, it's good that you ask because it's an important phenomenon that you must be able to identify. If in a person who is unstable, um, you should try and get him back to normal rhythm as soon as possible. Um, but remember, if you're planning to cardiovert them or defibrillate them, then the, they should be sedated before you do so. Yes. Okay, because it's painful. Okay, one thing uh, I like to add to Nisa's uh, this unstable arrhythmia, the arrhythmia may actually be not life threatening. For example, SVT, okay, or atrial fibrillation, they're not really life threatening arrhythmias, okay. But the thing is, 
they were, if they are left untreated for a long time, they may present with heart failure. Okay, so and that may make them unstable. So take a very good history again. Okay, recognize your ECG, and then the treatment must be staged to a immediate treatment. What's the moderate term treatment and the long term treatment? So next week we will cover that. And then we will go on to, I hope that answers your question, Darren. We go to Anna Karina. Oh, that sounds a very uh, famous name, Anna Karina. If a patient collapsed in a cardiac ward, can VF be picked up from the cardiac monitor? Oh, no. Okay, so oh, we cannot wait for a 12 lead ECG if the patient is in VF, Karina, uh, Anna. Okay, so basically, um, like we say, a 12 lead ECG is very useful. Okay, to sometimes uh, to make a diagnosis of certain diseases, but when it comes to arrhythmias, sometimes, okay, especially ventricular arrhythmias, uh, and especially VF, any cardiac monitor will show a VF, and immediately you need to treat. Okay, uh, that is why sometimes we only have three leads on the cardiac monitor. We don't need many leads on the cardiac monitor because we are looking at the rate and the rhythm. Uh, Niza? If you find a person in the ward that is pulseless, then you activate your uh, BLS. Yeah? So um, if they're pulseless, they're not breathing, you start CPR and then get somebody to put an ECG monitor on the CG lead on them. If they you find that they are in ventricular fibrillation, the treatment is cardioversion or a defibrillation. So that's that's standard. Uh, you should uh, uh, be able to do that. Yeah. You, that it's very rare that you get a 12 lead ECG of a VF. Uh, <laughs> usually that happens uh, incidentally. While you're actually doing a 12 lead ECG, the patient goes to VF. But you don't take a 12 lead ECG of a VF. Okay. So Brandon asks again, is heart block a common complication which occur after surgical removal of calcified aortic valve as the conduction system. Yes, yes. Uh, Nisa? Yes, it is. Um, calcific aortic valve is one of the cause for complete heart block as well. Um, there, but if you do valve surgery too, you can actually develop a AV block. Not only uh, aortic valve, sometimes in a large ASD or a large VSD, you can actually cause uh, aortic, uh, sorry, AV block as well. So um, surgery, surgical intervention can expose people to AV block in certain situations. Now, um, I, then he asked whether tachy or bradyarrhythmia is more common in cardiac tamponade. Definitely tachy arrhythmias. Um, usually it's just sinus tachy. I don't think... Um, it is uh, common to see uh, VT or in cardiac tamponade, usually the blood pressure will start dropping and the heart rate will go up. And it's always usually sinus tachy. So I think it's a completely different presentation. Uh, and cardiac tamponade is a very, very nice um, disease to treat because the moment you just put in your needle and the fluid comes out, the patient will feel so much, much better and the heart rate will come down. Um, I wanted to say something, but I can't remember at this point of time. But what, oh yeah, I want, I remember now. Um, we have not gone into much about theory. We actually today just wanted to show you a lot of ECGs make sure that you all know how to feel comfortable um, and confident about reading ECGs because it is not something that you can do from the textbook reading. A lot of things can be done from textbook reading. We have not shared that and I don't think we need to share that. Um, you can always ask us questions. Uh, we do have a Telegram group chat. Uh, join us there. Uh, I think uh, will help you get into the group. We're going to add Ahmad Niza into the group too. Um, Niza, I tried to add you actually, but uh, you are not on Telegram, I think. 
I am actually. Oh, I, I don't see you there. So I tried to add you yesterday. So okay. join, yeah, join oh. our Telegram group. Okay. Uh, we do have a Facebook, uh, which is Beating Hearts. Uh, do like our page and then we take more uh, we will take um, any last questions uh, sorry doctor I have one question yeah, uh, sure. for reading the arrhythmias uh, mm -hmm. is it like every lead uh, I mean that when taking the chop lead arrhythmias is it like the lead 2 will be the most common one where we can see the arrhythmias or is it possible like uh, lead 2 is normal but some other leads are abnormal Okay, well, usually they will all be the same because it's, it's simultaneously, right? So lead two is because you can see the P wave the best. And is that? Oh, all right. I, I would prefer, if possible, to get a 12 lead ECG uh, of any arrhythmias, except for ventricular fibrillation, obviously. <laughs> um, but if it's possible, the patient is stable, do record a 12 lead ECG. Um, besides identifying the arrhythmias, a 12 lead ECG can help us in a lot of other ways. Uh, we can be able to identify, let's say, for example, accessory pathway, where the accessory pathway is, or if it's an atrial tachycardia, where the site of the atrial tachycardia is coming from, can be uh, discerned from a 12 lead ECG. Even in ventricular tachycardia, you can actually uh, sort of roughly point out where it's arising from. So a 12 lead ECG is always a, uh, a good to have a 12 lead ECG of the arrhythmia if the patient is stable. Um, the, the 12 lead, you will see abnormalities in the rhythm in all 12 leads simultaneously. But a long lead too will usually be uh, helpful because the other leads tends to be very short. Uh, if you have a long lead, uh, then you can uh, see the rhythm uh, at a, a longer uh, time period and see whether it's stable or not. You know? well, always remember that um, a lot of arrhythmias don't happen by itself. They all, a lot of times, they have um, underlying, underlying condition. So a trough lead ECG is very extremely helpful, especially, let's say, in a bradycardic uh, patient, okay, definitely you can see maybe ST elevation in the inferior lead, then you know that this patient actually has an inferior MI with bradyarrhythmia. Okay? So just don't concentrate on the patient's ECG. So again, it is very important to know how to recognize ECG, but at the same time, always go back to your history, your medical examination, which is very important, okay? And if you don't treat an ECG just for the treating an ECG, always remember, okay, the ECG is not just a pure diagnosis, okay? Uh, I think that's very important. Any more questions? If not, we have uh, done about uh, an hour of chat. I think we will stop here next week Friday next week next week Saturday. Yeah. Five o'clock again. Join us. Dr. Ahmad Niza will speak on the treatment of uh, all the arrhythmias, uh, including pharmacological um, treatment, uh, again devices and procedures. Um, and so stay tuned and then also join our telegram chat group then. Anything, just message us. See you then. Bye. Thanks, Nisa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Yeah, thank you.